I think it's fair to say that three common problems facing hobbyists today are lack of time, lack of money and lack of space. So what if I told you that you could buy an entire army for less than 50 quid, paint it up in a day or two and store it, along with all your terrain, in a single shoebox? Well, when you opt for collecting and gaming at the 6mm scale, then all these things are entirely possible. Listen, I love 28mm minis and rule sets, and they'll always be my favourite, but I think that 6mm is such a great complement to it, and we'll dive into the many reasons why I think that on this episode. By the way, did anyone else have Space Marine when they were wee? What a game that was. Don't think we ever played it properly, but the big orc and elder armies, the cardboard skyscrapers, all the wee vehicles, classic. Anyway, I'm not the best person to talk to you about the joys of six, so I'm joined on this episode by Peter Berry of Bacchus Six Mill, who are one of the foremost companies working on this scale today. The name Bacchus is an interesting one, so I thought I'd make that the starting point of our conversation. I asked Peter what it means and where it came from. Oh, you had to start with this one, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> um, it's all a misunderstanding. Uh, Long, long time ago, when I first started doing this sort of thing, I had to think of a name for the company. And because I'm fairly pretentious, uh, I thought, I'll just use a Latin term. And I, the Latin term for berry is Bacchus. You, you knew that, didn't you, Matthew? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll say yes. Yeah, yeah definitely okay, not. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's Bacchus. That, that's fine. And... Uh, I was running with that. I got some business cards printed and some catalogues printed, and and I didn't actually check the name properly, and it should be spelt B A C H U S. But all the initial printing right. came back with a missing H, so it's been backwards yeah. without an H ever since. And it, 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 did you ever get pedantic people asking you about that? Or does nobody does nobody bother? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. I've got to out the same story all the time. So yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the company started on an entirely mistake, and it's probably carried on from there ever since. Yeah, well, it's not how you start; it's how it's what you do after that, isn't it? And uh, I mean, you guys seem to be doing very, very well. Certainly, a company I've purchased a few things. I'm going to talk about that, but I've, I've dabbled with six mil. Um, so any six mil I've got, I think I got it from you. Um, before we dive into that, what, what are you working on at the moment? You painting anything? You building anything? Um, well, most of my paintings taken up with preparing stuff that we're going to be releasing in the next two, three months. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got some great war releases, which I'm working on, on painting the display items and just making sure that they're okay. Uh, some Ancients releases, I can't tell you about those because those are very top secret. Uh, mm-hmm. But those are, that that's a range we haven't uh, let the world know in advance because normally we, we tell people what we're going to do. Well, this is a bit of a surprise range, so I'd like to keep it that way. Uh, but let's put it this way, there might be chariots involved with it, and that's all I'll say. Good. But I'll be doing that over the weekend. Who doesn't love a good chariot? Yep. And uh, there's my Pony War stuff, which I'm beginning to amass, uh, which is going to be my personal collection. Yeah, Pony War, you, you'll have to excuse if I'm ignorant of some historical reference with Pony War, I'm not, it's not something I'm remotely familiar with. Is that a thing I should know about? Or oh, Where have you been for the past year, Matthew? Where have you been? <laughs> oh, Pony War's massive. Um, the, the Pony War's project started uh, a long, long time ago, uh, back in the 1980s, and I am that old. Um, I was part of a group of four of us who put on... Uh, participation games around shows in the north of England. And mm-hmm. we did various things, Western gunfights, gladiatorial combat, chariot racing. So the idea was people could just turn up and play a game. And that sounds very run-of-the-mill now. But during that period of our wargaming history, um, it, it wasn't a common thing. People didn't go to a show and play a game. It, you, get, you went to watch games or put in a demonstration games, but the idea of a participation game was was a bit bit out there. Uh, mm. the, the the leader of our little group was uh, was a chap called Ian Beck, who was oh just a just a, a, a towering figure at the time. He he was the one who came up with the ideas, wrote the rules, and he, his enthusiasm was infectious. He, he was an amazing guy, 
And one day we all turned up at his house, which is where we, we did all the playtesting, the working on these. And he came up with this idea of, I've got a game and it's a bit different. And it was, it was Pony Wars. And the premise of it is based upon all those old 1950s Hollywood cavalry movies you've seen. Uh, you know, the, the mm-hmm. John Ford trilogy of Westerns. Uh, she wore a yellow ribbon. And everybody is on the same side. It's the the Indians, the hostiles, are all controlled by effectively a pack of cards and a few reaction tables. And it mm. sounds very crude, but that particular little setup created one of the most devious, nasty, cunning opponents you could ever, ever hope to come across. And the, the odds were really stacked against the uh, cavalry actually getting anywhere. And as anybody who's played the game over the years will, will testify, that that remains the case. And the idea was there were some homesteads littered around the table. You had to go to the homesteads, persuade the settlers to pack up their worldly goods and get back to the safety of the fort before they were basically pounced upon by uh, by hostiles on the warpath. And then you added to this uh, the fact that the civilians wouldn't always do as you were told. And while you were playing the game, your wagon train might turn up on the table. And you were responsible to get that back to the to the fort in safety. Uh, you might have other characters turning up, a Pony Express rider, uh, a stagecoach, uh, even the Lone Ranger made an appearance. And every game was different. No, there were just random events and, and random happenings all the time. No two games were ever the same. And they were just massive fun. They were the sort of game whereby people would play they would come on the table, they'd have their command wiped out in 15 minutes because it was that bloody. And then they'd immediately sign on for the next bit because the next cavalry or the next civilians to come on, they would take take on board and they would play them. And they would spend all day at the show playing that game. And as I say, it became a bit of a legend of that time around that part of the country. Now, very sadly, um, Ian uh, died in a car accident in the uh, mid-1980s. And the remaining three of us really didn't have much of a heart to carry on taking the game around. Mm. It was very much something which he led. And we kept in touch, but we pretty much went our separate ways. And that really should have been the end of it. The The Pony Wars rules themselves had been put into print uh, by a company called Tabletop Games. And I think they sold quite well for them. But obviously... Tabletop games over the years, they they folded. The guy who ran that died, and the company passed into various different hands, and it folded. And there was just no source for these rules. And there was a constant, constant demand through basically four decades of people wanting copies of these rules. Um, Now, as uh, Bacchus became more prominent uh, from about the, the turn of the millennium onwards, people began to associate my name with the Pony Wars rules, and I've been getting emails for the past two, 20 years saying, is Pony Wars ever going to get reprinted? Can you get me a copy of the old rules? Can you get me an old copy? And there was a mm. massive head of steam. It was it was, it was uh, quite touching for us that, that the rules themselves are remembered with such uh, fondness by people, and the game was. Uh, so as a result, over the past 18 months, we were we decided we'd reprint the rules. The three of us got together. We decided to reprint the rules and bring them up to modern production standards. So the originals were the old uh, black and white reproduced in a staple booklet. The one we've produced is full colour, lots and lots of photos in there of, of games in progress, gorgeously painted figures, lovely scenery, uh, proper professional layout. And uh, the the game came with a pack of cards. Now, back in the 1980s, you got some file cards and wrote these out by hand. Uh, today, we've actually got uh, it's a double deck of cards, all properly colour printed and laminated. So it's a we did, we went to town. We gave it a, a really good makeover, and it's been phenomenally popular. It really has uh, all over the world. We're, we're we're getting people buying it from as far afield as Russia, which is really, you wouldn't expect to have much interest in this. Mm. Um, we, we, we've sold them all over the world, as, as well as to the places you may expect, uh, the US and, and the UK, all over Europe. And people want to play the game. It's achieved a, a legendary status. With that, uh, you, you mentioned the sort of AI. So is it something that lends itself 
to solo play. I mean, given that given the way the world's been for the last couple of years as well. Oh yeah, it's a major major strong point of it. Uh, in fact, to be honest, the the system that Ian put together has been. I'm not going to say copied. I'm not going to say plagiarized. Has has inspired other sets of rules and other ideas, and people have adopted the basic mechanics to other eras. So, for example, um, again, I'm going back in time. But Peter Gilder, who used to run a holiday centre, ran a, a Sudan game based upon exactly the same principles, lifted straight from the rules. And I know people have used it for um, fantasy. It's a good guys against the the orcs and the goblins. And I know two people are putting it for use for the Zulu Wars. And yes, the great thing is that can all be done solo. So it's got a mm. it's got a very broad appeal outside of what you might think to be its its very narrow focus. Just uh, pulling us back to the uh, the concept of six millimeter war game in itself. So when yep. someone sees these miniatures for the first time, I mean they are they are tiny, <laughs> um, and you know a lot of people who come into the hobby that they're immediately familiar with twenty eight or you know games workshop style these days, which is a lot bigger than that. So um, why why six millimeter for you, Peter? What what is the what was the attraction for you to dive into that aspect of the hobby? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll preface all of this by saying your introduction sounds brilliant, but you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Six millimeter figures mm. are tiny. Twenty-eight millimeter figures are very, very big. Good, good. Okay. So you have to sit at this from my worldview. Yeah. Uh, I, I first got attracted to the idea of six mil, and believe me, until at this point, you wouldn't have dragged me anything away from the larger scale figures until I hit this barrier. Um, I, for one reason or another, had to do some six mil buildings for uh, modelling and, and selling. And one period of history that's always fascinated me has been the 18th century, the, the Morburian Wars, the Great North Wars, and it's a time of sieges. And uh, the idea of you know the, the Vobanesque star forts and fortifications, always wanted to do that, but in 25, 28 mil, it is so impractical as to be not worth bothering with. Mm -hmm. And the moment I actually produced this six mil hexagonal trace with the bastions and the demiloons and the ravelins, this little light bulb went on in my head. And I went, you know, in six, this was going to be so easy to do and it's going to look so great. I can get the entire game on the table. I can play a game and I could do siege lines. And all these ideas about possibilities opening, doors being flung open, was something there before me. And... Why didn't I think of this before? And I hadn't thought of it before because I didn't like everybody else. I'd started off with minifigs and hinge lift figures back in sort of the 70s, 80s. I progressed through foundry because that's what you did. That's what you always did. And you never look beyond that. So you start a new project and no matter how impractical it is in the scale you're used to, you just go that way. This very mm -hmm. fortunate tore those blinkers away from me. And yes, yeah, so six mil proved to open a lot of doors, which I had thought closed. Now, through a, a long and convoluted story, I obviously got into manufacturing the little guys. And alongside that initial revelation, you begin to realise, well, they're easy to paint. And that may sound counterintuitive to so many of your listeners, but honestly, they are really easy to paint. They're quick to paint. So in terms of gratification, I could get my army painted and on the table in two weeks. Uh, whereas in two weeks, with my bigger figures, I probably didn't actually get half a regiment done. Mm -hmm. uh, and they looked great because suddenly, although the individual figures were small, they weren't as well detailed, they weren't painted, there were lots of them. And I had mm -hmm. brigades that looked like brigades. And then you find other ways where they become advantageous just by using them. Transport. Um, you can get two armies in two file boxes. Uh, you can carry the terrain for that, and a good-looking terrain, in a third file box. And you can carry all that lot on a bus, a train, put it in the back of a car. So easy to do. Uh, storage. 
you know, you you've just got a small little cupboard at home. You can put it in there. They take don't take up any more room than a couple of boxes of Monopoly. Twenty eight mm-hmm. mil. Well, you've got the complete reverse of that. As I say, they're very very big, which means a lot of mm-hmm. them become very very heavy, and the boxes you carry them in have got a big volume. Yeah. And the scenery have got an even has got an even larger volume. So it's that little practical side of things. Then when you come to playing a game, uh, the six mil units have got obviously a much smaller footprint on the table. So the equivalent sized army, say lined up on a table with a six mil army and it's got it in 28, the 28 will form a curtain from one side of a six foot four by six foot wide table from one side to the other. And your tactical options consist of being able to go forward quickly or slowly. And, and that's it, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas in 6 mil, you put that out there and suddenly you can't anchor flanks on a table edge because your armies aren't big enough. You've got to have deployment in depth because you need to keep reserves to be able to shore up a wing. And your gaming actually becomes more realistic. It doesn't become playing the game because that's your only option of just moving forward and moving back it means that you've got to actually think about how the game's played and how your generalship is going to change you have to learn to play with exposed flanks and it produces a very very different mentality in 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 gaming and i I think one for the better but there again um very very biased do you tend to play these games on a six by four then, despite yes. the decreased size of the miniature? Yeah. What uh, what rule sets do you typically tend to use then when you're playing? Well, I'll answer that generally, then I'll and I'll, I'll hone in on specifics. The great thing about six mil is you do not need a set of rules designed for the little toys. It doesn't work that way. Mm. You can use any set that's designed for pretty much any scale of figure with six mil figures. Uh, you can do it a number of ways. Uh, one way, which is how some people start, it's how I start on this line. If you've got a 28 mil figure that sits on a 25 mil square base, you remove the 28 mil figure and you replace it with eight, 16, six mil figures. So the unit frontage, unit footprint remains the same, but instead of having 24 figures, you've got 96, 120 figures so then you play the games as normal so if you get a figure removal you just remove one base of 16 little figures mm. so that the game mechanic plays exactly the same when you move over to the more modern ways of playing games which is to use a a base as as a unit uh, i think games like mm. the eba family that's even easier um you have a 60 by whatever it is, base, DBA, which is could normally house four 28 mil legionaries. Well, you just replace that with 96, all on one base. But you actually have little gaps between the lines and you make this little mini diorama with the, with the guys. So how many, uh, uh, just to, to cut in, and then how many units are we talking on a 6x4 per army, typically? Well, I would say you could play a game comfortably with 24 to 30. Mm. Uh, but a lot would depend on the rules. For example, a very popular choice of rules for six months at the moment are the Warlord games, Black Powder and Hail Caesar. Yeah. Uh, they use multi-base units, so you might have a large unit which cons- actually consists of three bases each measuring 60 by 30 so that's that's quite a large table footprint for a unit uh, mm-hmm. and that will reduce the number of units you'll have on the, t- on the board if you use um our in-house rules the the rules we produce uh under the Bacchus banner uh they predicate a 60 by 30 base as a standard for a standalone unit so a battalion will be one of those uh, but you use those put into brigades, so three or four of those becomes a brigade, and your brigade becomes a unit of movement. So you've got this bit of blurring between what's a unit and what is the formation using on the table. One of the things I'm curious about, something I struggled with a wee bit myself, was immediately identifying which units were which. Um, if I if it, if I was playing with quite a new army, is there is that just a thing? You know, you get to know your army pretty well. Um, 
because it's not sometimes immediately clear, you know, are the guys got crossbows or bows or um is that is that a reoccurring problem at that scale? Not really, no. Uh, and perhaps again, I, I, I know my little men quite intimately. I've sculpted many of them, so they cast quite a lot of them. So I, I never really have that that issue. Uh, mm. Some people like to put little unit markers on the backs of the bases. You know, mm-hmm. this is thirty third regiment or first battalion, whatever, on the back of the reg- on the back of the bases. Um, I've not really done so because I've I'm, I'm found that's a, that's that detracts to me from the appearance of the base. One comment that I've had from me from people who don't play six mil, um, and this is the 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 guys who, who use the big figures normally, they say, "Well, I've seen the game. I couldn't tell exactly what I was facing. You know, I couldn't tell whether they were line or guard, or I couldn't tell you whether they were heavy cavalry or medium cavalry." And my point is, and that's a problem. How? Because real life generals didn't know exactly what they were lined up and facing. So why should you until the come yeah. a bit? So, so to me, that's yeah, a bone. No, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. But, but in organising my own troops now, I've, I've never had that as an issue, and it's not something that's come back to me much from my customers either. I've um, played a few games uh, using the Kings of War rules, and I just yeah. um, scale everything down, and it works really well. Um, was really happy with it, and yeah, just um, that that different experience, that different perspective. Because I've, I love all the imagery, of the, the huge um, battles, and you talked about sieges and stuff. But when you're working at twenty eight, unless you're you know going to create something huge, it, it's little more than a skirmish often. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas six mil, you can really say like this is this is pretty accurate with the, the number of guys on the table. Yeah, it, it's oh, I can put it. It's the best use of the space. The, the problem with we humans and war gamers are humans is we've only got so much of a reach. Uh, we talk mm. about the ubiquitous six foot by four foot. That's because that table hits a sweet spot in terms of how much area you can get and how easily you can get to any point on the table. You mm-hmm. start getting bigger than that, and you're in trouble. And the problem with the larger games is to actually get the impact you need, the one you're talking about, you would need tables probably measuring 16 foot wide, 30 foot long, and you're not going to be able to move the troops as you need them unless you've got some sort of flying pulley system in the middle of the table. And you can go <laughs> above, above like uh, Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible and moving things around. And the, yeah. those fit- which you just can't get over unless you start chopping tables into strips and that looks really clumsy and quite awful to be honest the um the genres uh, represented in six mil it, it seems to me and again excuse my ignorance because I, I don't know half as much about it as i'd like to but it seems to be overwhelmingly historicals um i've come across a wee bit of fantasy but is that correct or is it that just me showing my ignorance there and I'd, I'd say it's pretty well correct. Uh, it, it's not that the demand isn't there. I think it's because the people, the manufacturers, have mainly concentrated on historicals. Uh, that's my major point of interest, and so that's mm. where I push the direction of the company. Uh, I think the possibilities for for fantasy are, are, are massive. I mean, you, you can imagine, say, a recreation of Pel- of Pelinor. The climax of the Lord of the Rings. Um, mm. You can literally get tens of thousands of orcs on the table, and, and a massive line of of, of Rohan uh, riders just just coming straight over the ridge and into them, and a beautiful model of Minas Tirith. We could actually look reasonable at that scale. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the the possibilities are, are amazing. It's just that the traditionally and, and we are very traditional the, the the larger companies working in six mil have, have stuck to historical i mean i've got a very very small fantasy range which is a pretty whimsical thing designed by my son when he was about eight or nine years old uh but, but there are a couple of new companies or uh, newer companies who are beginning to produce quite decent fantasy ranges and i think you'll see more of them as more and more people come into six mil especially if they're coming from something like a workshop background where uh, uh, fantasy is far more acceptable. Uh, so I'll give a shout out here to uh, uh, Perfect Six. I've got a nice little range. Uh, there's a company called Rapier who are actually doing uh, some Glaranthan miniatures. Now that may only appeal to people of a certain age, but they're from a, uh, the RuneQuest world. 
uh, and mm. uh, they're there producing those, which are lovely little figures. And there's a company over in the, the United States uh, called Microworld. They do a, a very decent range of six ball fantasy. And it's something we'll be moving into in a more serious way over the next uh, couple of years as well. Have you ever stuck a 28 mil uh, miniature on the table as a giant? Proxy well, that's the sort of thing we will be doing, except we will call it a 6 mil giant and not a 28 mil figure. Yeah. But our dragons will look good. Yeah, I and um, again, that uh, ability to have loads of big characters like you're saying dragons uh, war machines stuff like that if you're working at 28 mil you know that that thing is going to be unique whereas um if you're working at six they could be many rather yeah. than uh, just a one-off so. yeah it, 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 it's you've also got the cost of all of this and it's not a factor i've mentioned before but the cost of something of the scale we've been talking about in the larger scales is prohibitive even if you go plastic mm-hmm. it is prohibitive um the small scale stuff it is cheap as chips, as they say. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you can get a lot, lot of bang for your bucks when you when you pay your money out. And that, that's another wonderful aspect of it. So when when uh, I ordered my my guys, I can't remember exactly what I ordered. I just I wanted to get um, a lot of stuff and just form up two different armies. Um, so they might well have been the same army. I'm just going to paint them different colours. Uh, so the, the the way six mil uh, miniatures come, they're on like a little strip. Yeah. And uh, do you recommend painting them on that little strip before you um, put them together into a regiment? Yeah. Um, in fact, if you go to my website, there's a how-to guide or a starter guide on this. Yeah. The, mm. the way to, to paint six mil is, is a little mantra you'll hear again and again in the six mil world, which is paint the unit, not the man. So... Mm-hmm. I will get, say, a battalion where I'm putting 24 figures, which is six of our strips, and I will glue those six strips side by side onto uh, like a tongue depressor or a a lolly stick, and that will be my unit of production. So whereas in larger scales, you might paint those in batches of six, complete six, then move another six, move another six. In one sitting, in 40 to 45 minutes, I will have that unit painted. Mm-hmm. Front and back, ready to go, and then it'll be based a separate session. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you paint the entire unit. Uh, the advantage of doing that is, first of all, you get the uniform finished to it all, but you you have then to learn to let go. Not every figure is going to be perfect. In fact, there's going to be mistakes probably in every one of them, but it won't mm-hmm. matter because what you are painting, what your appearance is going to look like, is the finish, the entirety of the unit put together. So the individuals yeah, don't. Yeah. It's the unit that is the important thing to keep in mind when you're doing your painting. So would you you would paint each strip? Then would you would you put a bit of varnish? Because bearing in mind we're working in kind of metals, um, would you put a bit of varnish over them yeah. before gluing them onto their, their base? Yeah, I always I always drop a bit of varnish on them now. I mean, years ago I I, I used to varnish my 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 big figures. I, I used to sort of like put household polyurethane gloss varnish on them to protect mm. them, and then put a couple of layers of matte varnish on until I got it down to the sheen that I wanted. Uh, I'm a little less yeah. fussy now. I just bang some uh, some matte varnish on them. But yeah, it, and also varnish just pulls your paint job together as well. It's, it's very strange, very subtle, but it, it does just enhance the final uh, final effect. Is your varnish, do you spray it on or is it brushed on? I just brush it on. I just uh, Valley Ho do a very nice little matte varnish. And, uh, you mm, know, yeah, sick, I think that's you the one I've it. got, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a really nice, efficient little varnish. I find spray varnishes are messy. Yeah, I just hate spraying stuff because you have to go outside and it, you know in Scotland it's never <laughs> open the door. It's never conducive to um, doing anything like that. So, uh, and I don't want the local kids throwing stuff at me because they see me spraying toy soldiers either. So, um, what about uh, when you when you glue them onto the wee bases? So. Are you putting um, a little bit of basin around the edge just to kind of finish the effect off for of the the grass? Um, I suppose. Well, again, no. Um, I for quite a while now, I've I've actually been selling a basing system. Uh, some of you listeners may actually have come across it. Uh, 
to me, there's a lot of nonsense talked about basing, and a lot of people make life really, really hard for themselves. Uh, where mm-hmm. you know you you put them on the base, and then you get tetrian filler right up to the edge, and then you 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 have to paint the whole thing, and then then dry. Um, you know, just life's too short. Uh, it's a very very simple system. You glue your figures on. I just use a PVA glue. Once that's dried, cover the rest of the base in PVA glue. Dip it in a very very fine sand. We're talking six mil here, so it's it's really really fine sand, not the stuff you use for the bigger mm-hmm. figures. You let that dry, which doesn't take long. You drop a brown wash onto that, uh, which is a matter of seconds because the sand basically just sucks the the wash and just spreads it over the entire base. Again, let that dry. Doesn't take long. A bit of dry brushing. And then PVA back onto the base and you apply the flock. It is a very, very quick and dirty system. Uh, you cut out all the, the filler and everything else like that. The grass will cover the plinth of the of the, of the base. You, you won't see the base at all. And you just, eye is drawn to the unit, to the sort of the brown green effect around the around the unit and it looks great dead easy dead simple and if you've been on my website you'll have seen a lot of the figures in the catalogue they're all based using that system and it's by the time you've done batch basing with it it's it's probably about a minute per base in total here's a question for you peter if hypothetically there was a a moron who'd glued glued all these um uh, guys onto the base before he painted them, um, and he's potentially a podcast host called Matthew. Um, w- what might be the best way for him to this hypothetical guy to to paint his um, miniatures, and and the, they still look pretty decent? Okay. Um, well, it's, it's, I'll I'll answer this for your friend, shall I? Yeah, my friend. Oh, yeah, that's right. Friend, he's not alone. There's many people do that. And while he's made a lot harder work for himself than he should have done, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, just paint them. By the time you've done the paint job and you've looked at it from three feet away, um, they'll look fine. They'll just look fine. It's I've just got contrast paints, which I think are, they make life a bit easier, don't they? Yeah, they. they well, again, I've, I've seen them using six with mixed results. I've seen some quite good ones, mm. and I've seen some which have look like a miniature car crash um but yeah on the whole especially if your friend has taken them off the bases and clumped them together like that they're really really going to hard yeah. to detail in them i think the contrast mm. paints probably his best friend um i because it's it's going to be getting the trying to get the when my friend does this trying to get the green grass in between the soldiers is going to be tricky um, it's not really because all he needs to do is to you get water pva glue Mm-hmm. Uh, get it down to about the consistency of milk, then use a paintbrush, just just paint it literally in between the bases, and mm-hmm. then uh, get the get the uh, flock on. So it won't be a problem, provided he goes about it sensibly. Yeah, well, that would be a first. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever come across in your life somebody trying to paint an eye on a on a six millimeter soldier? Not quite, um, but I do talk to a lot of people at war game shows, and and I they come up to my painter display and say, "Oh, I tried painting these, I couldn't do it," and you start talking to them, and they're typically typically guys who've got decades of experience in the big figures. They try to paint a small figure, and they've tried to do exactly the same way they do the big figure. Mm. So I had real trouble painting the, the piping on the collars, and you're going, why? <laughs> well, you don't need to paint the piping; let it go. And it, yeah. it's that sort of level where people are trying to just use exactly the same techniques on the big guys with the little guys, and it's not going to work. But they're conditioned to do things like that. You know, where where can I put the buttons on? No, no, the, forget buttons. Yeah, yeah. The, the, anything pu- like the pupil on the eye. Yes. Yeah, I can't. I can't even do eyes on a uh, twenty-eight. So um, the thought of the thought of doing it in six just um, that's yeah. insanity. No, it, it, it's brilliant. <laughs> Face painting in six consists of there are two techniques, but the easiest one is you put a blob of flesh on, 
you let that dry and then you drop a, uh, some brown wash into the, into the cavity. And because the mm-hmm. figures are sculpt, the figures are really well sculpted. Not not just mine, but you'll find across the board the quality of sculpting in six is amazing nowadays. Um, fills the cavities, and you will find the face appears. Um, they look excellent. The uh, t- terrain as well, like what um, what sort of terrain do you like to see on a table? I know that completely depends on what kind of game you're playing, but um, will you do lots of houses? Will you do wee villages, rivers, castles, stuff like that? Well, everything you do in big scale, obviously you're going to represent in the smaller scale, but you can do it, I'm going to say better. Oh, look, at, let's take an example, a village. in With the big figures, uh, a village is a building because if you try to mm. put three or four buildings, that's about three quarters of your table space gone because the footprint yeah. of the building is so large. And even so, that single building is still disproportionately large in terms of the ground scale of the figures you're using. That's just a fact of life. Mm-hmm. Well, in six, well, you know, you, you can make a little village. You might use three, four, five buildings. You can put little bits and pieces, but it won't dominate the battlefield like the big buildings do. Uh, you want to do a wooded area. Well, you can do a big wooded area. Um, there's lots and lots of workarounds of how you can play a game through that. But essentially the way to do it is to do a, a base with, uh, I can put this, a, 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 an outside line of tree trunks mm. and a canopy that sits on top of that. So if you want to put troops in the wood, you just remove the canopy and you move troops inside that little girdle of tree trunks around the outside dead easy to do Mm -hmm. it looks good and it's practical but you can also take it to the extreme um i don't know if you've seen any pictures of it but the winner of the best in show at salute this year was a game based on the battle of poltava from the great north war in 1709 and the terrain on that was just magnificent there was everything Mm -hmm. in there beautifully sculpted uh rolling scenery uh, a big river uh, valley, a uh, big hillside, uh, an entire Russian town, monastery, city walls, everything you could do. But that was mm-hmm. just the backdrop to the game itself because the game itself was played with that just there. So it set the scene, it told the story, it created the narrative beautifully. And having the ability to manipulate your scenery so it doesn't become the dominant thing on the, on the battlefield but becomes a... A partner in the game it is is massive. Yeah. It's a good advantage. Uh, I mean, I, I've just seen too many big games ruined by the dominance of scenery where it shouldn't be dominant, mm-hmm. but it has to be yeah. to get a lovely model on the table to show off. You've got to sacrifice table space, and therefore it distorts the game a bit like a black hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've I've talked a wee bit on the show in the past about the the, the problem with twenty eight millimeter um, mass fantasy sort of rack and well not necessarily fantasy but rack and flank games. Um, I often find that you you do need this just big area, this big football pitch in the middle of the table, so all the units can get around, and then your your scenery is almost just um, window dressing because it's all around you, but mm-hmm. they're not really interacting with it too much. And I dare say there'll be a few listeners who might disagree with me there, but that that's my own experience. You know, the, the scenery's around you and you're inside it, but with six, um, there's a lot more scope to move through the scenery and use it a bit more, I think. So yeah. that's um, one of the sort of appeals of it for me. Yeah. Now, uh, just just I know we've been talking about six and concentrating, and, and obviously I've been taking compare and contrast, and uh, probably been giving the guys who normally use twenty eights a bit of a hard time. Uh, it, it's not. We are talking six. I'm trying to explain the the advantages vis a vis the larger scales. Big scales are great for the appropriate sort of game. So I've got twenty eight mm. and they're brilliant for skirmish games. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing a game which is a small-scale action, big figures are great. And I think you'll see most of the commercial releases over the past five years uh, where people have released a new range of concept figures or something are, are skirmish games. That's where 28 mil strength is, and I think it's where companies coming new to the market realise that. I mean, even Games Workshop mm-hmm. with their age Sigma effectively taken what was a big mass battle system and brought it down to just, you know, a dozen figures. 
Whereas the converse is the largest scale of action you want to produce, you need to go with smaller figures. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, it, it keeps a, it accessible, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. It's about using the right tool for the job. Uh, I've mm-hmm. always liked mm-hmm. trying to do the Battle of Waterloo in 28 mil is like trying to use a hammer to put a screw in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wrong tool to do the wrong job. You, you, you've you got to have the appropriate tools to do it properly. So, yeah, 28 mil is great when you're doing one-to-one gaming, when you're doing that sort of action where you've got a lift-off roof and you move your fingers around the house. Brilliant, and, and long may it be so. But for doing the big games, I, I think it's it's uh, it's a bit of a dead end. Controversy there, because I'm sure your listeners will, will rally to the defence of what they've got. <laughs> But I'm allowed my opinion. Be honest, I'm, I, I potentially don't have any anyway, so we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is the uh, how is the the six mil side of things in the hobby looking in terms of um, young people? Because uh, famously, you know, the youth they, they come in via Games Workshop. I think that's a, a fair statement. So, um, how many sort of youngsters do you do you tend to see playing six just now? A few. Um, to be honest, I, I'd say it's pretty representative of, of the rest of the hobby in terms of the cross section, um, mm. and uh, the, the 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 feeder mechanism for new players in historicals uh, away from workshop is workshop into something like Warlord, then Warlord going. Well, you know, there's a greater world of historical wargaming out there, and then they're moving through that. Um, the problem is that feeder mechanism is 28 mil based. So mm-hmm. it takes a bit of time. But yeah, um, I would say uh, that at Joyo 6, we, which is a war game show purely for six mil figures, so it's a pretty good cross, cross section of, the, of our community. It's pretty much the same sort of age range you would get with the big figures. I don't think there's anything massively different. Uh, so I, I would love to give you an insight and a revelation there as to why it's great for young'uns, but <laughs> at the moment, although of course it is great for young'uns because it's decent, they, they can get a lot of money for uh, the bank of the book. But I find that younger gamers are more daunted by the size of the figure than the bigger ones, than the older ones. Mm-hmm. Like that 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 is probably a barrier. And no matter how much I say it's easy, uh, if you're used, your comfort zone is being in your little games workshop shop or your little store, paint the begins, play with the begins, and you're not that necessarily confident in your own painting, painting ability and somebody says, try and try these things which are quarter the size. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. see why it's daunting. So uh, uh, we try and bring people on, but you, you've got people have got to come to us first just to enable us to, to show them how to get on with it. The um, What what was your, was it a show you said it's called Joy, Joys of Sex? Joys of Sex, Joys of Sex yes. Is that the- yeah, do you, do you get a lot of plays on words with six sex? Do you, do you find that a lot? <laughs> We've had everything. Uh, six appeal. Six appeal, uh, good. It's mad. Yeah. The fear are six. Uh, six drugs and rock and roll. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had everything. Um, but yeah, the joke <laughs> thing is, is, yeah, it, you say it to people and they have a little snigger to themselves. Uh, the first time. Yeah, you've just, <laughs> thank you very much. Show we started about eight, nine years ago. It's grown from, we never had any ambitions for it. It's grown from being what was just a gathering of a few signal gamers into something which has become big. And I mean, really big. In successive years, we've had to take on more and more room each time. Uh, now, the last event that we had pre-COVID had 35 games being played on the same day, which is mm. a hell of a lot for... A, a, a small show and we actually had to turn get people away um and we get visitors now turning up from all over the world it is a massive reputation in the six mil world uh for the quality and quantity of games we put out there and it's turning mm-hmm. into a showcase for our side of the hobby uh so we invite editors of war games magazines we have a panel session and we've had uh uh uh, editors of, of two of our illustrious Wargame magazines appearing on that. And we'll hopefully get a third this time around. And it is a, it's an amazing show. It's an eye-opener to anybody who doesn't know anything at all about the scale. It's well worth to have a visit because it's it's showing the little guys at their best and brightest. 
and it's great fun. Where and when does that take place then? It takes place in Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam University in July. It's July the 3rd this year, which is a Sunday. Uh, Mm. We do have a a website, which is very basic at the moment, called The Joys of Six. Uh, But it's all over the the, the Six Mill groups. If you just just tap into a Six Mill Facebook group, you'll find references to it there. It is the mecca now for Six Mill gamers from all of the country and all of the world. And the thing is most... We've had to do it because we found that no matter how good a game you put on a, a, sh- a conventional show, it got pretty well ignored. That the big guys sort of muscle in and nobody looks at your little game, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it got it got people very frustrated. So we just decided to give a nice little friendly show for people who could then go along, relax, and show what they can do. And so it's grown from that uh, to the point now whereby one of our aims now is to actually get people who aren't six more gamers coming along to the show to have a look at it and so mm-hmm. i would really really recommend it and the great thing is if six more isn't your thing it's one of the cheapest shows you'll ever come to because there'll be nothing on sale there that you'll want to spend your money on so you can just yeah. go and stay looking at games however I think by the end of the day, your fingers will be itching and your wallet will be open because there's lots of six mil trade <laughs> in there. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it will awaken your uh, your enthusiasm for the scale. I will guarantee that. Peter, it's been a, a really good uh, conversation and I hope that um, a few of the listeners who maybe not checked out six mil stuff are, are uh, you know, pretty interested in going and having a look. Is there anything that um, we've not covered that you would uh, wanted to bring up or touch upon? Um, not really. I find with these, it's best for you to lead. I mean, I, I could spend all night talking about what we do and how we do it. And, and to be honest, it would get very, very boring. If you're the slightest bit curious about Six Mill, or we, we've just uh, piqued your curiosity about it, the recommendation I'll say is have a go. Don't think, oh, I can't paint it, or it's too small, or whatever. Just mm-hmm. get a packet of figures, pick them up at a show, just mail order it from, from us or from, say, from any of the guys in the six mill world, uh, and just have a go and ask advice. I mean, people can always email me. I'm very responsive to emails or contact me on Facebook through, through our messenger service. You'll find it a really, really nice welcoming environment from uh, the, not only the guys who supply the figures, but the people who play with them. It's, it's a really close knit little community. But you must try it. If you can think, no, I can't do it. I'll try it one day. No, just do it. Just order a pack of Romans or some French line infantry and have a go. And then you can find out whether, basically, I've been talking rubbish all evening or they are as easy and as friendly to paint as I've said. And they do look as good as I've said. And I think, actually, I'll you'll come down on my side of the argument once you've actually done that. Yeah, and just don't be like my don't be like my friend and glue all the guys down before you've painted them as well. No, no, I mean, I mean there is help for your friend out there, counselling service and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah. I'm sure if you contact me by email, I will uh, be happy to help your friend out with some more practical advice. Big thanks to Peter of Bacchus Six Mill for an excellent and insightful chat about all things six millimeter wargaming. You'll find links to everything mentioned here in the show notes at bedroombattlefields.com slash six. And through the wonders of technology, you could write six as in S-I-X or you could just do slash six as in the number six and both will work. Isn't that amazing? Um, In other podcast news, I've done that really cliched thing of starting a Patreon for the show as well. Uh, I just want to quickly qualify it with a few things though. It definitely won't be used to help or support the podcast. I know every other podcaster says stuff like that, but with this one, like if anyone pledges to it, I'll honestly just spend it on beer or nappies. Uh, The the beer's for my daughter, the nappies are for me. (laughs) And uh, the other thing is like if anyone anyone pledges to it, they won't get any fancy extras or bonus content. They'll, They'll get none of that. So you'll get nothing at all if you pledge. It'll just be money deducted from your account on a monthly basis and uh, and spent on beer or nappies. Is this the worst Patreon in all of podcasting? Quite possibly. And you'll find it at bedroombattlefields.com slash Patreon. Thanks as always for lending an ear. Stay subscribed and we'll catch up again on the next episode.